went to Wharton's MBA program, then was trading equity options when the subprime bubble did collapse. That was really a wake up call that <laughs> really just about everything I had learned in college, undergrad, or on Wall Street, you know, never quite added up. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Mark is here with you for Arcade Economics. And today, a video that I think you'll enjoy because I did an interview with Bo Polney yesterday where he was asking about some of the things that I've been seeing in the silver market uh, and amongst which why for anyone who is looking at Twitter tags of silver squeeze being down and wondering if the situation's over, what I would suggest folks be aware with, wink, wink, uh, shortage delays in the thousand ounce wholesale bar market, which is of course, uh, I've not seen any JP Morgan silver reports covering that yet, but that's why you can come here to Arcade Economics. So hit the subscribe button and the notification bell if you want to hear what is really going on in the silver market, because it is coming your way now. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bo Polney, and I have the pleasure today of having Chris Marcus on my channel. Uh, I wanted to get Chris on the channel, and he's so gracious to give us a bit of his time. So thank you, Chris, for being here. Um, Chris is a specialist. He's had over 20 years of experience in equities in the stock market. He used to work on the stock exchange, uh, and his experience uh, is, is incredible. And the reason I want him here is because for the last weeks, maybe months, I've heard Chris constantly speaking about silver and silver and SLV and the contracts and what's going on. And honestly, I know very little about the numbers. It's not my specialty. So I wanted to talk to Chris uh, and get his knowledge and his specialty on silver and all the contracts and how it's working, what he sees going on. Then I wanted to layer in something really unique. As everybody knows what, what I do, I specialize uh, taking biblical timelines and I'm gonna layer them onto the markets. And at the very end of this, we'll even include some silver some silver and gold charts to kind of show people where we're at. So I think this interview is gonna be really exciting because we're gonna talk about the, you know, the, the, the core of what's going on in the markets. And then we're going to layer in timelines and Bible prophecy into what could and may be happening here. Uh, some very exciting times pointing to for precious metals. So without ado, Chris, I appreciate your time. Thank you for being here. And can tell us a little bit more about what you've done uh, in the markets and give us a little bit of your history. So thank you for being here. Sure. Well, thank you. It's, it's fun to be here with you and certainly an exciting time in silver world and Perhaps um, I'm sure you well know, I believe Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver a couple thousand years ago. So my first job was Moody's after two years there of seeing a lot of stuff that didn't make sense, but I would learn more about when the subprime bubble collapsed, went to Wharton's MBA program, then was trading equity options when the subprime bubble did collapse. That was really a wake up call that... <laughs> Really just about everything I had learned in college, undergrad, or on Wall Street, you know, never quite added up. I started reading Austrian economics, understanding why I really just started searching for the few people who had seen the subprime issues in advance, who had written about it in advance. And I thought, well, all right, here's Bernanke and Hank Paulson. They couldn't even, they were saying it was contained even as it was imploding, yet why not hear what the guys who got it right said? That was pretty life-changing for me, led me to gold and silver, understanding the Federal Reserve, understanding a lot of things in the world that don't really make sense on the surface of them. Go figure, the government and the banks are not always giving us the 100% honest truth, which again, maybe isn't what I would advocate, but fortunately, I think the best, the, what what is making me more excited than ever before is we're seeing that you know, this idea that these are these big boogeymen that are impenetrable, I don't believe is the case. And it, it's inspiring seeing how just by honest people sharing correct information and pointing out some incorrect <laughs> whoppers that get tossed around there is actually making an impact, which we're seeing now. Um, you know, you're mentioning the, the, the bubbles and the crashes, right? So what I've noticed when I go back in the charts um, the each crash that we've had so far, uh, starting with with the with the bubble, um, which was the dot com bubble in 2000, right? If you go back, 
that actually led to the start of the bull market for gold and silver, right? And so you had your first run on gold and silver. Then we had the crash, which was a second crash, which was a crash of 08, right? So that crash of 08 led to the second run for gold and silver up to like $1,900. And then we had a correction. And guess what we just had again in March of last year? The Corona crash, right? And so guess what we now are involved in? Another bull market. So as much as they're trying to take down the precious metals, they're having a heck of a difficult time just because the markets keep pushing higher. There's the cycle that I look at is up for gold and silver as much as they want to keep hammering it. They, they can, but they're not breaking the cycle. The cycle might go sideways, but that's not a break of the cycle. And ultimately, we're still going to be exploding higher in the precious metal. So, um, you know, with that said, so my cycles point to higher and much higher prices into the future for precious metals. So what are you seeing in terms of uh, contracts? What, what, what are the key topics and key points that you're actually seeing right now that that's causing a lot of um, you know, that, that's basically really interesting you in terms of the, the degree of contracts that are being printed versus the volume versus the price. Go ahead and take the floor and give us some information as to, because I'm really curious as to what is happening really in the real world. Sure. And I will do my best to uh, explain. I mean, some of these concepts can get a little complex, but nothing that I don't think we can break down. So if there's anything you need me to explain again, please let me know. But Perhaps one cycle that I think everybody can agree on, Democrats and Republican, dogs and cats, boys and girls, we've seen this cycle. I mean, you can trace it back to before the Bible. Governors and bankers in whatever form or whatever titles you call them, they are always printing and trying to use this same scheme of stealing money via the printing press. I mean, we saw it with the Roman Empire. You're seeing it now. I was stunned. I, I've not watched the video yet, but I'm told that 40% of the dollars in existence were created in the last year. Well, and that's where I'm going to just, I'll show you a couple of charts that I have in terms of timelines, right? But in terms of what you're discussing, Chris, see, the, the dollar itself, I look at it as a debt instrument, right? And so if you owe the bank's money, you are enslaved. So really what, what the dollar has done is it's created uh, a willful enslavement of people because they want to own, and in order to own expensive properties or homes or credit card, you know, what ends up happening is that you go into debt and now you're enslaved and you're willfully doing it. And the, this is the best part. The bankers create the money out of where? Thin air because they don't exist. So they're creating them. And, well, they, they don't and, even print it out of thin air anymore. It's out of thin digital. Digits, yeah. Well, in, this is what I wanted to, uh, in terms of the, the time, there's, there's one cycle that I wanted to uh, make reference to. Um, I'll stick a PDF link at the bottom of this interview. Uh, but on page six, which I want to show you here, Nixon, in August of 1971, he detached gold, from the dollar. What did he do? So by doing that, he, he in essence detached our money that we're using today from sound money from gold. Right. Okay. And so that in terms of a cycle created something really important and epic because what it created was that started the a 49 to 50 year cycle, which then takes us all the way. And then this is discussed in Leviticus 25, nine, where it says sound the, sound the trumpet on the 10th day of the seventh month. So and that would be from the new year started on September 19th of 2020. That takes us to April 23rd of, and that would be the 50 year Jubilee cycle. So as crazy as this is, God allowed this to go on 49 years and then now the 50 year Jubilee cycle. Uh, so they, they can, they've had the ability to print money and slave humanity for 49 years in the 50th year. This is where it's supposed to all change. So we'll see how it goes, but, but that's actually a really interesting cycle in terms of printing money to infinity, because you can print money to infinity until God says no more. And that's why I look at it from a biblical perspective, right? At some point this has to end. 
<laughs> this just can't go on forever. <laughs> How long have you been studying gold and silver? How long am I doing it, right? They've just been printing this forever. And, and at some point it has to end. So we'll see how it plays out, but I think we're in some really incredible timelines here for what, what might be happening. So are you seeing anything else like in terms of that might cause a pop or something to shift really dramatically? What, what's, what are you seeing? I sure am. I mean, it, from what I heard about from CNBC, uh, it sounds like Janet Yellen is polishing up her trumpet. She's taken it out of the case. She's she's ready to blast that trumpet all day long. I mean, they had a meeting reported yesterday that Jamie Dimon wasn't Jamie Dimon with as and Yellen with the president, alleged yeah. president. Let's say alleged president. I, I mean, I how how is Jamie Dimon in the White House now? And that is a little concerning to me. Uh, there's a book. I don't know if you've, you've heard of this one by an author named Helen Chapman. Incredible book called J.P. Madoff shows how J.P. Morgan was the sole banker for that deal, which in my uh, research I've been told is quite unusual. Normally in that type of fund, there would be a syndicate, yet J.P. Morgan shows up as the only one there. List of felonies. I mean, the fines they've been racking up. Again, they... I believe I was told the correct term is settled with the CFTC. They paid a 900 or they settled. I mean, it's interesting to wonder. I don't, I mean, how do we even know if they even paid the fine or if they didn't just submit it to the Fed's discount window, uh, perhaps in a question for another day, but. Well, if you operate a business, right? If you make a million dollars and then you pay 200,000 in expenses, right? Then you have a net profit of 800, right? So if let's say apply this to the banks, let's say you make a hundred billion dollars, you pay two billion and or say 10 billion, you're still ahead billions, right? And so I think these, what I look at it is these damages they're paying, even if they're paying them, they're just operating expenses. Yeah, it's essentially a tax. And I would say a small tax at that where, you know, Bo, I guess the one of the things that doesn't sit well with me is that they signed this thing or the, or, or the CFTC said hundreds of thousands of occasions, not a few, not 10, not a hundred, not 5,000. JP Morgan didn't spoof. They, they didn't hold it to 20,000. This is the CFTC's words, Hun hundreds of thousands, which I believe would imply multiple hundreds of thousands. And we know a little bit more about this because there were several traders that have signed confessions that we're able to read. I mean, I'm not making this stuff up. You can go, <laughs> the guys confessed. Every, every single one of them mentioned that it was done, it was widespread practice at the firm, it was done, it was taught to them by the, the senior guys. So it wasn't an accident and yet they, settled for 920 million dollars and there's no comment there's no jail time for any of these people right so you can commit as much paper crime white collar crime as you want that's what these bankers can do and not one person's ever prosecuted for what they do it's rather incredible it's a great deal right you just so you have you run a business uh you have operating costs of say 20 percent so those would be legal damages but the damages are just on paper and no one gets prosecuted. Um, I don't know. Look at the last stock market crash. Did one person go to jail for the, for the, for the, for the real estate debacle, right? Did one banker go to jail? Has one banker ever gone to jail? This is what we're living with. You know, certainly there's that. And I can understand that feeling. I mean, to be honest, I really don't give a darn whether Jamie Dimon is in or out of a jail. My guess is that people are okay with doing that type of thing. You know, you could be in a mansion and your life is probably hell yet. I just think it's kind of telling where, Bo, you go on the camera, you show your face. Hey, we're all human. Same with me. I go on there. I don't claim that I get everything right, but it's like we don't hide. I don't create an alias when I get something wrong. I don't disappear. I, I account for it. And here it is that I, th I think they've admitted they're wrong. They, they've paid money or they've theoretically paid money. I've not, uh, maybe someone out there knows or can track down if that money's even been paid. They didn't say what for. 
They have a long track record of felonies. It's interesting. There's an article about a hedge fund manager named Daniel Shack who got a settlement from JP Morgan, which I might point out for everybody who's given up hope. This guy went in and his lawyer said something and JP Morgan wrote him a check. So Bo, just between you and me, don't tell anyone, but I may have contacted the lawyer that, you know, already won that for this guy and, you know, we'll see how it goes. But just that, I think it's a lot of these things and maybe that's where the spirituality, whatever someone believes. And I know there's a lot of, but just the idea that it's interesting once you see, you take change from that beaten down and I get it. And I've been there where it's like, you know, we've a lot of us gotten our ass kicked for the last 10, 20 years. If you did invested in silver, I mean, if <laughs> now on the other hand, if you invested in gold 20 years ago, you've, you, you're up six X. Well, even the, stock market bubble is only the Dow is only up three X and I find, you know, maybe we just, you know, a silver bugs like to see the downside that often gets missed, but you know, these things last, like you said, until they do. And I mean, now we have a system where there's, there's large chunks of metal reportedly being added into SLV that, <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, I spend far too much time than is health healthy for any person to dig a bit into silver. I can't find anyone who believes that that metal could have been taken out of the market from somewhere else and put in there. You had 60 million ounces, which is over 5% of what's mined in the entire year on last Tuesday alone. <laughs> so it's like 20 days like that, you know, for, I mean, that would be, so the trust did that 20 days in a row, that would take the whole supply for the year it means no electronics, no solar panels. California's got to slow down on all of that. So 60 million ounces were reportedly added in there on a day when the price fell 10%. JP Morgan, we don't know what they, they have yet to have any comment. And they're also, by the way, we have these amount of metals that frankly, no one thinks is possible, let alone believes. And who's the custodian, not only of SLV, JP Morgan's the custodian of the, there's several other silver trusts. And now I've heard some people say, well, you know, there's oversight. There's someone making sure I called iShares. That's who runs SLV. Mm -hmm. I called them last week and I wanted to make sure I was getting things right. I said, when they say they add 10 million shares, does that mean, you know, they're going to get 10 million ounces or it's, you know, the work? No, they said it's added that day. I repeated it back. I said, Am I getting this right? Who adds that? JP Morgan. So now JP Morgan has access to a lot of pools of metal. No one can figure out how the numbers add up. And, um, you know, so there's certainly a time I think people that are, are looking into these trusts, I would highly, again, I'm not a legal financial analyst. I'm a silver, uh, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm a silver analyst. I worked on a trading floor. So but I would suggest that if people, if you're putting your money somewhere, because when I was asking for the audit, one of the iShares, she couldn't find it. <laughs> so it wasn't, you know, then finally, after I was like, are, are you sure there's not, she told me to go to the SEC's Edgar database. So it sure didn't sound like, you know, when people were buying, there was 60 million in one day, 110 million over three days. It doesn't sound like they were beating down the phone asking for the audit to make sure that they feel comfortable with the procedures in place that everyone's taken the word for JP Morgan. And I pray, I pray, I hope very much that the metals in there, I would, I would love to be proven wrong or I'm not, not proven wrong. I mean, these are, I would think I would be financially liable if I knew what I'm finding out and didn't say anything and told people, go put your money in there. I can't make legal financial advice. Obviously I'm speaking to a, variety of different people, but at least me, I would not put my money in there and any of my friends or people I care about, or what do I say to the people that advise or I talk to on my show there, I, I would at least encourage you to look into some of these things. Double well, check what I'm saying. 
Well, and it, it makes it makes sense because even when you saw the silver to gold ratio, like how does a ratio go to uh, over a hundred percent when it's supposed to be roughly ten to one, right? So in the last market crash, we saw the ratio shoot up to one hundred and twenty or something to one. So for every ounce of gold, you can get a hundred uh, you can get one hundred and twenty ounces of silver. It's mathematically impossible to see these things happen. And I was listening to a show the other day, and you're talking about how volume is spiking, but yet the but the price is crashing, like. That doesn't make sense. When when you see a volume spike, it's because people are buying, not because people are, are selling. So nothing makes sense in this, but then you have to step back and you look at it, right? So I look at, again, when I look at this biblically, you know, my thought, very simple, is this. Um, it's all about, like, when you go to Hollywood, they have props, they have, it's all about a facade. But behind it, there's nothing, right? But it looks good in the in the front, and and it's all about appearance. So when you've when they've detached the dollar itself from gold they now have created the ability to create print create money to infinity which they've been doing and because they can create money to infinity they have the ability now to use contracts and computers so they keep manipulating the price down to hold it down because why it's all about the dollar because the dollar is the instrument that controls everything it involves the bribes the payoffs everything and so as long as a dollar continues to have value then their game can continue to go on. And so that's how I look at it. And no matter how um, how long this continues to go on, at some point, the, the bubble itself has to burst and, and pop. So I, I agree with you, you know, just um, holding silver in its physical form with the actual bars, coinage, then you know you own silver. But if you're holding it because it's easy to click a button or to tell your tell your broker to buy SLV for you, right? I'm not giving advice. I'm just saying, think about this, right? If someone, if you tell somebody to go buy for you some silver and they say, yeah, I'll get you some SLV, some contracts, right? How do you know that there's something to back it, right? And let's say it's all great. And then there actually is a silver there on, on the SLV contract. How do you know you're going to get be able to get your hands on it? There's just too many ifs. And so if you're investing large amounts of money, if people are, you know, taking a life savings or, or a good chunk of their, of their wealth into silver, because, oh, don't, I've got silver. I, I've got it. You know, I've got SLV. So I know I'm, you know, if they're holding it, they think they own silver, but nothing more. They think they do. There, is, may, there might be a one day that, that they're going to find out that they only own the paper representation of it. Um, and they can never potentially get their hands on it. So as long as there's a middleman between you and what you want to have, there's always that if factor. And if you want to put all of your uh, eggs in one basket saying, you know, I trust, I trust them, and you don't even know who them are, then, you know, then that's, that's everyone's choice. But again, you know, physical, but the way to hold gold and silver, as you know, Chris, is, is in its physical form, because that's the only way you know you have it. And that's really the reason for it. It's, it's because there is no middleman between you and it. So that is how I look at, at what silver and, and gold really are. Um, they're supposed to be held in their physical form because you know there is no middleman between you and, and, your, and your investment or your, or not, and your finances, basically. So, and I just find it fascinating that in one year, they've created more money than they have in the past 10 years or however many years it's been. But, you know, on the last market crash, I think in March of last year, didn't they print something like five or $10 trillion to prop the, to get the market back up on, on that crash? I think it was some insane amount of money that they had to print to, just, just to prop up the markets back up. So it's a dangerous world we're living in right now in the financial system. If people uh, don't have any insurance, you know, people buy insurance for their house, for their car, for everything, right? But for their finances, they don't buy, you know, and they don't buy physical gold or silver. And any any large investor, you know, I, I personally have, you know, I know quite a few people that, you know, are large investors and, and they all own at least a chunk of their wealth in physical gold and physical silver. In terms of getting metal, what are you hearing? Are you hearing that it's easy still to get precious, to get gold or silver from some dealers or is it is it getting tighter? Uh, I know the prices have jumped up quite a bit in terms of the spread. So what are you, what are you, what are you hearing, Chris? I'm actually, I was surprised today because today uh, we're recording on Wednesday is the first day I have heard of now wholesale tightness and shortage 
on the wholesale level, the thousand ounce bar level, not just retail anymore. And perhaps, uh, although, could we come back to that in a moment? Because I, I, what you mentioned was important, and I'd like to make one comment on the idea of a middleman. <clears throat> By all means, I don't know. I mean, you know, I do a show about silver. So if I had like $10 million of silver bars and, you know, I everyone knew where I lived, maybe, you know, there's some situations in which having a third party is good. But I mean, let me put it like this, you know, let's say, you know, your parents own a house and they have a basement. Wouldn't you feel more comfortable there than with a bank that has a track record like these banks do? Because, you know, here's another thing with some of these trusts. I mean, maybe the metal's there, but I've heard, you know, I have a lot of different people writing in and digging through the prospectus now. And there's a lot of that disclaimer stuff where, you know, uh, oh, well, there's this fee here, that fee there. I find that when you interact and you hang out with people who are good people and treat you like family, hey, maybe you don't see everything, but they're looking out for your best interest. You have a good shot of things going well. When you're hanging out, you know, with people who are into some not so ideal stuff, maybe outsmart them, but they're looking for every chance possible to pick you off. I'll tell you what, if we talk in a month, I'll bet I'll have a much clearer idea of what's going on. But certainly right now, right now, I'll just say there's a lot of coincidences that don't leave me feeling comfortable. And I tried to be fair. I didn't try. I called the trust and asked questions and I was shocked at the answers. And perhaps it's not surprising because I think, and now coming back to your other question of the, the demand, I think it's interesting because what kicked a lot of this off we had the short squeeze in GameStop. We had the short squeeze AMC, a few other stocks. After a day or two of that, people are like, oh, what's this thing silver? I hear a short squeeze there. I can't speak as uh, intelligently to the GameStop situation. I'm not as fam really at all familiar. But I can tell you that there's a lot of things in the silver market that have never added up. So throughout that weekend, you had what multiple dealers described as panic buying greater than even the ones who had seen the Hunt brothers. I had several of them on my show. They talked about it in detail. I do believe, I mean, there's, there's multiple reports. And just to be completely accurate, this week I've heard that the buying is steady, but has come back in, down. It's calm. It's calmed down. So, but I mean, also, forget about that. If we just look at this SLV trust, they added the Friday, the uh, 29th, I believe it would have been, so about two weeks ago, they added 34 million shares, which according to them means they added 34 million ounces. And if you look at what was is actually- that, Is that possible to do that? And like, is that really possible? Like, what are your thoughts on that? that? That's a lot of silver. I don't think so, but give me one more minute and then I'll leave you with a question and a chart where you can tell me if you think it's possible. Friday, you had 34 million, which is the annual, which was the entire amount that was left for these trusts last year after industrial and physical demand, which I don't know anyone who believes those are substantially coming down. So if we had the same numbers as last year, 30, 31 and a half million was all that was available. On the first day of Silver Squeeze, you had 34 million allegedly added. Okay, that's normal, I'm sure. Then you have people, bullion dealers, to the degree, actually forget whether panic buying, whether you believe that or not. What is factual and can be verified is that, so after that Friday, you had 34 million ounces. On Saturday, by Saturday night, AppMax, JM Bullion, and then Sunday morning, SD Bullion had to suspend sales. And then eventually, Miles Franklin, and I'm sure others, because what they, the amount of metal they had hedged, they did have additional metal, but they had sold what they had allotted for that weekend. So they couldn't hedge on the COMEX. So you have silver open uh, $3 higher that night. Keep in mind, First Majestic, which has a large short position on it, had soared from about $14 the previous week to as high. I think it touched 25. Now it's not really public knowledge who is actually short all that First Majestic. I... <laughs> I would love to know if any regulators want to discuss that one. I'm guessing they don't. But in the face of that, then day two, when you have this price sort, another 20 million ounces. Then here's what's interesting, Bo, and I would challenge any of your readers to, if they can explain, or I'm organizing evidence for people to send to the CFTC. So this is on the record. 
So Friday through Monday, you have stuff that blows away what even David Morgan, I have him on camera saying, we even blew away the Hunt brothers. So here's silver pretty high up there. Then you see this, this is Tuesday morning, you know, like 2 a.m. in the morning. See this big volume spike. Now, Bo, at my trading shop, I'm pretty sure I would have been thrown out the door the same day if I ever executed a heavy order in the middle of the night when volume is the thinnest. We were specifically trained never to do that. I might add, I also have former Commissioner Bart Shilton, who was presiding over the CFTC's uh, investigation into silver manipulation, who flat out, I, I, you hear me ask him, it, my, I said, my understanding is that Nudge the price a little bit, put some pressure on it. Then you start triggering the stops, the algorithms, and the same guy who sells it up here is usually one buys back here. There's the volume. So you, people, you can see it for yourself. And if someone's new to the chart like this, here's the price, here's the volume. Someone who's traded professionally in the pit of the New York Stock Exchange trading equity options, seven years and then has studied this for another 10 years after that I, I don't know what else i can say except i tried to make sure i was right and i even got the darn guy who used to be the commissioner of the investigation who f <laughs> you don't, don't take my word listen to it for yourself mm -hmm. or look at it on the chart and then bo what would i tell you if in the face of physical buying that blew away what the hunt brothers what people experienced through the hunt brothers time and at the same time, you have additions to SLV that no one I've been able to find can see how it's possible. And yet the price keeps dropping. Oh, well, well there's one, one other thing you didn't, I, didn't, I didn't mention. So just to be fair, right around here, JP Morgan issues this sell report. <laughs> at 5 a.m. in the morning, Tuesday, right in the face of all of that, which seems a little inopportune time Headline miners decline as JP Morgan downgrades sector in silver. And Bo, I would imagine, tell me if I'm right, you're probably wondering, well, gee, what? how did they explain why they're, sell they're saying to sell? Well, there's panic buying going on, including into their own, the trust that they're the custodian of. So, I mean, and anyone who should be paying attention to those numbers, Bo, I'll, I can send you the link. We can post it. If people can find where they actually, not only didn't they mention that, they don't even, at least this article doesn't even mention anything about why silver was going to go down. Although I'll bet if someone wasn't looking closely and looked at that headline. Yeah, there is a reason. If we know that there are now large amounts of capital that are traded by computer algorithms that scan headlines. And Bo, I know you've been around this stuff for long enough. Is it possible that the Wall Street media could use a headline to create an impression that might not be in the best interest for investors. Has that ever happened before? Is it possible? <laughs> well, what happened when gold, remember in 2011, when gold went to uh, $1,900, all you saw all over the news was buy gold, buy gold, because they knew what they were going about to do, right? What do they do? Slam the price for the next few years. So you had a bunch of gold bugs buying gold at $1,800, $1,900 in 2011. And then for the next six, seven years, they slammed the price. Just like when gold was um, down to $1,050 $1, in 2015. What are they saying? Um, the price is going to keep going to a 200, you know, 300, 400. It's going to keep crashing lower. You know, so the headlines, you know, don't buy gold. It's going to $500, three, you know, uh, there's one guy particularly that would, you know, I, I'm sure you know who he is, you know, Mr. $300 gold, right? Uh, it, he just constantly, you know, right at that moment in time, he's flat out there saying gold's going to $300. And, and I'm telling my cycles say that's the bottom. And it was the exact bottom in December of 2015. And so the news, you're right, Chris, it's always 100% opposite of the fact. The news is what they're trying to achieve. And they want to, and they're just looking for suckers, you know. And so I have my, 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 my subscribers call me regularly. Hey, you know, they just said gold's going to drop down to $1,500 or, you know, when it was dropping or $1,200 is going to go down. I go, no not going to happen it's just it's just fake news and it's it's all it's all you're hearing so you cannot trust the media and the news articles 
for trading gold. You actually should be doing the opposite just because you that's their plan is they post the news and they, then they do the opposite. That's basically what, what the agenda is, is, is to try to not get you in because they know that the greatest asset you can ever hold as a safe, as a safe haven for yourself and your family is precious metals, gold and silver, you know, there, because there is never a middleman between you and your money. So it's, it's the safest asset to hold in terms of security financially. Um, I, you know, I, I look at cycles from a long-term perspective and, you know, short-term and every time that I see these articles come out, Chris, they're always opposite of what, I, what I'm writing for my subscribers. Cause I mean, the cycles basically, you know, I'm not hundred percent right, but, the, but we've been pretty accurate for quite a long time already. And, and, and right now I think we're at a really exciting point for precious metals because again, we're not going, they're not going down. Okay. Uh, give or take a few dollars. You know, we got a lot of excitement coming our way. Um, speaking of which, if I, I've wanted to show you this one chart here, Chris, in terms of price action for here is gold and all the way back to 2008 to present. So you'll see that in, uh, in October of, of 08, we had that low crash and it shot up to 1950. You see that red line, so the top chart is gold. You'll see that right in this area right here. That is the $1,550 range. So $1,550 right there. Yep. Then you'll see that they busted through it and forever. And this is where that news article we were talking about right here. Buy gold. It's going to 3000 It's going to 5000 You know, the, it was all over the media. And then look what they did. They slammed it here all the way into December of 2016. But look what happened. Right over here, it touched up against that line so basically there's a there's a rule in charts which you know as well chris which is resistance becomes support support becomes resistance right so this was support here and when it broke through it now it became resistance up here so you'll see that basically gold came up it touched it took roughly 100 210 days finally busted through it and went vertical and the next move was to a new all-time high in august of last year so we basically had this was the high. We had a new high come in here August of last year after it take after it taking basically seven months or 210 days to bust through it. So here's the exciting thing for silver. So you've got silver right here. That same line for gold is 26 bucks silver. Look what happened here. We had the same line get hit in 2019. We are almost at seven months. 26 was the challenging sector right here, which equated, which balanced off, which were equated to the same price point of $1,550, $26 is the number for silver. So when this number finally breaks, which we should see it break here very, very soon, once it blasts through 26, it's off to new highs, just like it did right here. So our next target easy on silver is going to be in the 60, above 60, because it has to break a new high over 49. So we're at least gonna to go to 60 plus dollars on silver in, not, in a not too far or not too distant future. So I just wanted to show you that chart because it's really exciting in terms of a timeline. The seven month, uh, 210 day timeline is almost at an end right now. You would probably know the timeline on the charts better than I would, although I would say would it seem interesting to you or anybody watching that the points you just described and touching on what we mentioned earlier last week, this was a retail buying panic. Now I spent my morning talking to various dealers that if I talked to four dealers today and I said, if I have a customer who wants to buy $10 million of silver, they're ready to send a wire. And they want to take delivery of it this week. Can you fill that order? Not they, they said they could fill it, but it would take at least till March. I said, why would it take till March? I mean, if the silver is there, why can't, why can't it be sent? And that's the mystery. <laughs> so now we have, because again, I think a lot of the dealers have talked about right, rightfully so. And now I, now I have a partnership with a dealer. I mean, but I didn't, you know, I've studied more from the trading side. I have a few notes here from a conversation with a few of the dealers, but basically, you know, there's 
you know, all sorts of stuff that I could say or data points, which may or may not matter. But what, again, is relevant to me is the money flows and the actual evidence. A few things to report. Premiums have been rising on 1,000 ounce bars. They've been going up pretty rapidly to the degree that one of the large dealers, it's a name, uh, he asked me to leave private. There are a couple that I can name. It will be in the video that I just released. But he actually described that he used the word comical. He's like, the wholesalers have raised the premium so much. He's never seen anything like that. Now, for anyone, I know there's a lot of time people wonder if the dealers are gouging. I don't think that's the case because even the wholesalers have raised their bid and he emphasized drastically that doesn't normally happen. I mean, from time to time, we see the uh, retail market go up. Last time this happened was last March, right around when silver went down to $12. And then those are, so it's like you always hear, well, you can push it so far, but there's some level where you push it too far, things get tight. I can't guarantee you what will happen next week, but all of these signs are headed towards that. Uh, to put some numbers on this, premiums two weeks ago on 1,000-ounce bars were around $0.20. Cents. I heard one dealer said he's still seeing quotes around $0.40 to $0.45. Cents. The other three said as high as $0.85. Cents. These are spreads that are generally pretty stable. And again, they said they could fill if somebody wanted $10 million worth of silver, but it would take a month. And I would say that is the definition of a shortage. If you can't even say, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll pay you twice as much as it's worth. And they just say, Andy Sheckman of Miles Franklin, he called one of his guys and they said, you can get it March 12th. He's like, well, well, why? And they said, well, that's how long it takes to get a truck together. Sounds unusual. And so, Bo, I ask you, we saw what happened when silver went up to 30 bucks a week and a half ago. And you, cre you created a buying panic, right? right. And, and we're still seeing the residuals of that because there's still spreads. And you're now you're still waiting roughly two to four weeks for your metal, even right now still. Yeah. When silver goes up, that created a buying panic. And then the next day it goes down 10% and SLV reports adding twice as many shares. So if the price goes up and people buy more and the price goes down, people buy even faster. I'm not sure which direction it's going. I mean, I guess it, you know, maybe, hey, if it stays the same, it's settled down a little bit this week. But what happens, and that's why it's interesting what you're finding on your chart and I, what I find people in all walks of life seem to be coming to silver at this exact time because, hey, just for the people who like the fundamental or event-driven stuff, papers were reporting yesterday a meeting of Jamie Dimon in the White House with Joe Biden and Janet Yellen saying that, hey, now is not the time to, to, to mess around. We got to blow, go big after there. Bo, if we had the real numbers, I'm not saying this to be sensationalized, but just as an analyst, if, if I had to bet on it, I would bet that if we had the real numbers, there's more currency now than in Weimar, Germany. And they want to go big and you already have tightness in the silver market now. Okay, so it's settled down a little bit, but what happens, I mean... Now you're in that environment. This is what happens with, with debt Ponzi schemes because, hey, maybe when Janet Yellen goes big, that's when silver moves. But it could be, I mean, on Monday, we saw it move almost a dollar. For the last six months, it was floating between 23 and 27. I mean, maybe the silver squeeze isn't done. I know that TD Ameritrade said that Twitter searches and hashtags counts are down. Okay, so for anyone who actually looks at what people are doing with their money rather than, rather than the trending Twitter topics, I mean, when you think at it through a couple steps ahead, I mean, I'm not saying there's a scenario in which this isn't reversed. That's always possible. But it becomes harder to see what it is, for me anyway. So I ask other people that I respect. They can't see it. And at the end of the day, there's that SLV number that's still... No one knows. And by the way, the last time the thing was audited was coincidentally the week before the price fell below $12, which I hope is a coincidence. I would say it. someone who analyzes and has lived through these banks, who's, who's trying to get my first job out of college while that subprime or the dot-com bubble was bursting, was hoping to hang out on my job when the subprime bubble was bursting. So, and I was on a trading floor. I mean, I don't think I'm complete bumpkin out of left field. 
And I mean, all this stuff, you know, it's, again, it's not my opinion. I'm, I mean, it's all there. I agree. We're all trying to see what will take to break the system, right? And because, because to break the, not so much the system, but to break the manipulation. The manipulation is basically, as we saw what happened, the moment it shot up to $30, they hammered it down $4 because they, they got to keep it at that 26 that I showed you on that chart because when it starts going up, that, that's going to cause havoc within the financial system. So they have to keep the, the price down. But what's happening is from a cycle perspective, they're running out of time. And so there's not much time left. And so what I'm seeing in terms of cycle, it's about to bust through that 26 and, and go vertical. Now, when you manipulate something, there's a law also uh, in, in cycles and it's called when price meets time. And so you can manipulate something for, for a, a month or two and then you'll have a reaction which will be sizable. But when you manipulate something for, for months, the reaction's bigger. When you manipulate something for years, the reaction's extraordinary. And so what we've seen here is minimum of price manipulation for the last 50 years. Because that's decades. When they well, and it's been decades. So we're, we're at least 50 years because they've detached it from, from the dollar when, with Nixon in 71. And the best phrase when Nixon detached it was, we are going to, I'm not making this up, temporarily detach gold <laughs> from the ben, ben Bernanke dollar. also said that quantitative easing was temporary. So there's yeah. a lot of things that's, yeah, you know, it's long temporary. Yeah, long temporary. So now we're now we're at uh, 50, 49 years and then the 50th year now. So I look at this as we are be we are at a at a biblical moment. And at those have watched my interviews, we are at a biblical. We're in biblical times right now, which which started in 2020. So this is the you know the start of of biblical times. Uh, we are in the third seal. The third seal is a financial rebalancing. So I I truly believe. Uh, and, and what my chart was saying is that we are at an epic moment where God is going to intervene and something's going to pop. And that pop is going to be when we just see gold and silver lift up vertical against man's will. And when I say, I mean, man's, it means their, their will. And because what is their will to keep it down? So the charts are at a point where we could see this pop. And I believe we're going to see it before the month of April. So that's what potentially is supposed to happen. I don't know the day because no one knows the day or the hour, but the charts are saying that uh, that cycle time point, we're supposed to see a, a massive move potentially any time between now going into the month of April. And by the end of April, it should have already happened. So we'll see, we'll see how it plays out. But here's another chart I wanted to show you because this actually is pointing to what I, what I believe is about to happen. So this is silver going back 40 years. So what we've got is we got a massive cup. So we got 50 bucks silver, 50 bucks silver, okay? We got a handle. And so this is 50, 40 years of price manipulation. And potentially, if the timeline is correct, at any point in time, whether it's sooner or rather than later, hopefully, when this handle breaks here at 26, you know, it, it basically tells you where it's heading. Uh, and the point is, is that once it breaks through here, it's going to explode and it. We don't know how, how fast or how high that could go. So who knows in terms of prices, but I can tell you when I look at this chart, all I see is that this points to a massive price explosion sooner rather than later. And my, the biblical cycles are indicating that we are in the year of Jubilee. This is the 50th year. Um, the 50th year is where God intervenes and makes things happen. So we'll see. But the, when we look at the, the silver and the spreads that are happening, as you're talking about, Chris, in terms of how easy it is now to get your hands on physical silver, it's a lot harder. Um, I think the next two, three months, February, as it, into February, March into April, as three months to go, um, I think we could see fireworks in the precious metals market. So that's kind of what I think is happening or about to happen. Yeah, and I, I think you have a lot of good points in there, especially, it's kind of interesting. We live in a world where Tesla's up 19x since the Fed started their swap lines. GameStop went up 25x in a couple of days. Bitcoin's up 10 to 15x, depending, or I, mean, I guess I got to raise the numbers. It's, all, it's almost 50,000 now. Yet, 
you talk about silver even hitting its 1980 high doing a double and it's like we're like what's this guy talking about well you know of course you leave aside the hyperinflation campaign yet bo actually there's something you mentioned there perhaps if i may ask you a question you mentioned the jubilee and in my own research personally you know i don't mention this often but i do feel that the guys at these banks uh, whether people agree with it the, the theory or not but i've found that they are into numerology a lot of occult things a lot of patterns and cycles so it was odd be i just remember because you said the word jubilee it reminded me of how so i've done a lot of research on when bear jerry p morgan took over bear stearns which was march 14 through 16 of 2008 and then also you had this historic, we got the historic Sunday night announcement 50 years later. And it was also Sunday, March 15th, which is the Ides of March. And I looked up what that means. It's the day Caesar was killed. It's known as a debt holiday. And I mean, I guess it could be a big coincidence, but I... I'm curious if you have any thought on any of that. These are the oh, that yeah. Actually, you know what? I wanted to talk about that, and I completely forgot. Um, so I'm glad you brought this up because, okay, so the cycle points is something big about the pop, okay? You, you, the cup and handle is about to lift vertical and just never look back, okay? So we're at a point there. Then you bring up the Ides of March, okay? Now, this is awesome because... So if you've studied my work, um, there's a cycle, it's the four, two, one cycle. And this is a biblical cycle. The biggest cycle version of it is uh, the 4,000 years of the Jews, 2,000 years of Gentiles, and then 1,000 years of, of marriage with Christ. So it's a four, two, one cycle, makes, if that makes sense to you, okay? There's many versions of that. If you go to my presentations of prior, I've discussed the four, two, one cycle. Going back from 2020, Shakespeare wrote the Ides of March. He wrote the play in 1599. There's the book right there. Okay. So the point being is that we are at an Ides of March moment. So I believe this beginning at the Ides of March, uh, I believe the dollar is going to start to take it in the pants. I believe there's going to be a massive problem in the financial market right around the Ides of March which is going to take us into, into April. We'll see how it plays out, but I believe that is the key time point which we're now looking for. Uh, we'll see how what happens over the next few months, but I believe, like you're saying, that Ides of March time point could be, it is supposed to be very, very critical for our, our world. We'll see how this plays out, Chris, um, but uh, I believe we are at a very epic point in our world, uh, both from what you're seeing on the physical side and on the contracts and the numbers, they just, if they didn't make sense before, you can't even make sense of it now because it, it's just beyond comprehension. The amount, the numbers are just astronomical. From a biblical perspective, Chris, we are at a point of liftoff for precious metals. Uh, and, and we are at the Jubilee time point. We're in the year of Jubilee. You know, there's that song, the year of Jubilee. So I, I know we're there. We'll see how this plays out, Chris. Um, do you have anything to add, Chris, um, before we, you know, finish up here? But I, I truly appreciate your time, you know, for being here and all of your comments. Do you want to, anything you want to add before we uh, wrap up? Sure. Uh, first of all, I just appreciate you having me and that you spread the message of gold and silver. I think it's a timely one. I never imagined 12 years ago when I started digging into this, this is where we would be now. Um, but maybe my one takeaway, this is my gut feel. So it's not in no means legal trading advice or anything like that. But the more I think about the context of everything that's happened in the past two weeks, 
And especially that the way there's the attention growing, uh, this Wall Street Silver Group, I don't know as much about the Wall Street bets, but the Wall Street Silver Group is quite inspiring seeing how there's a lot of people out there now taking all these videos that I'm doing, that you're doing, that other people who've been pointing this stuff and they're researching it and they're finding the, the same stuff we found and more. And then to see what happened last Tuesday in the face of that, it feels to me like Banks went all in on a big bluff, which is really the only play they ever have, exemplified quite eloquently in the big short. You saw how it's like this stuff. They just, you know, wear expensive suits, talk to you like you're an idiot and hope that you don't look any further. But now people are looking further and it's not really all that hard to find. I mean, you can see it on the charts. You can see plenty of days where SLV reports massive additions, yet the price falls. You know, like the day, the price, uh, the week, the two day period where the price falls from $15 to below 12, you in mind the cost of production for most of these miners around then was around $15 goes below 12, which is a little unusual yet SLV picked up some silver that day. So I think we're getting closer to the end. I would say that, Hey, if it happens tomorrow or in March or in April, then that's when it happens. If it doesn't happen. You know, I don't know that that means to give up hope because at the end of the day, you might you're, or you might be past Weimar Germany and Janet Yellen's talking about going big. And after Janet Yellen goes big, Bo, I'll tell everybody a little secret. Whenever she's done going big, they're going to go bigger. And when they're done going bigger, that's that's a cycle that has not been broken since probably since good and evil have been around and there's been financial markets. So they'll do what they will do. And I guess that was uh, my takeaway. One of my takeaways when I read the Bible of how there is that cleansing, whether it was the Tower of Babylon or Noah's Ark, where, you know, eventually the towers get too big and, you know, and then it becomes expensive and it eventually crumbles and, you know, maybe not necessary to know the exact day, but just enjoy watching and and feeling grateful for each day that we're in one piece and able to enjoy this stuff and take care of our families. I exactly agree with you. You know, the, the reason, uh, the reason for us to be here today is just to educate people to the truth. The truth is gold and silver are God's money. Gold and silver are the art insurance, financial insurance policy. That, that's kind of how we can close in this. They're gold and silver, are financial insurance policy for you and your family. And, and to not hold any precious metals, gold and silver, you don't have an insurance policy. It's a personal choice. Everybody has. We all have free will to make whatever choices we want. But, you know, we're, we're looking at something that has been manipulated for generations. The chart where, you know, that I just showed is a 40 year chart that basically, you know, at any moment to into next year, whenever it is, you're right, Chris, whenever it is, but the prices are not coming down much. The, it's a supply is now tight. And at some point it's about to pop. Biblically, I believe it happens this year in 2021. I believe what started in 2020 is the truth. People starting to see the truth for what it is. You, we're now awake. A lot of people are awake as to what's going on. Uh, and I, in 2021, we see the completion of what started in 2020. So we'll see how it plays out. Um, regardless, I am extremely interested to see what happens between today uh, into April, into the end of April. We'll see. I don't know. It's all in God's hand because all of this, in my belief, this is all God doing it all. And God's basically had enough and he's about to pop the bubble. So if it, this truly is the year of Jubilee, we're going to find out really soon, Chris. We're going to find out between now and April at the end of it. Uh, and when we're going to see something awesome that you and I and all the viewers that have been watching Gold and Silver have been waiting for for generations. We may just see that and I believe we are going to see it. Uh, here uh, going into into April, so uh, I hope you know we've enlightened everybody on so on you know what we see both happening on the physical side of precious metals and in terms of biblically. Uh, I do sincerely appreciate your time, Chris. Um, may God bless you and your family. And um, anything else you want to add before we close up? No, just thanks for having me on here. It was a lot of fun talking silver with you, and it's going to be. Uh... A lot of fun. My gut tells me that you're going to be right, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Thanks, Chris. God bless you. God bless your family. And thank you, for every thank you, everybody, for taking the time and listening to this today. So goodbye. So that is today's episode of the show. Hope you enjoyed that one. 
And if you want a little more clarity on any of the things that I mentioned there, I don't say any of these things lightly, but I did lay out a presentation that walks through at least the latest round of evidence, which uh, I've also been organizing a campaign. Soon we'll have instructions on how you can send that to the CFTC and their regulators if you would like. I think there's things that you deserve an answer to given that your tax money is funding that. And all you have to do is click in the box that is coming your way now.